my mum is a hat maker and textile person and then my dad was an artist, engineer and model maker. So um, he kind of taught me to draw really early on so around the kitchen table me and my brother would spend hours drawing all sorts of things from our imaginations but also from like Disney films and all sorts of things. And then my mum had a sewing room in the house and she taught me how to darn and mend things but it was kind of a casual thing it was just like we grew up in a kind of make do and mend sort of household so i studied at falmouth university um, which is in cornwall and i studied illustration um, it isn't something that i immediately thought i was even going to do because i actually did a lot of fine art interviews um, but in the end illustration felt like the right place to go for my drawings because they were often really small actually I always work quite small um, in tiny sketchbooks um, and I remember actually even in first year when we were doing visual um, technical design or something it we had to we had to have big sketchbooks and I always found it really difficult to fill a page don't know why but yeah so I felt like little books felt right at first and that's kind of where it started that's, it, that's what I started doing when I first got there. I just made lots of little books and filled little sketchbooks. And it was a really, really good course because it was really great kind of uh, in terms of pushing us uh, creatively and with various materials. So we, they, ta they literally taught us how to use gouache paint, which is a really opaque version of watercolour in a way. It's not thin, it's thick. And they did like colour and composition lessons and they did visual um, narratives and stuff like that. So things I'd, I'd sort of dabbled in before, but not with any real know-how or understanding of pace and flow or page turning in a book and what an illustrated book really is and how it works and how it stimulates you as you read it as a child, all that kind of thing. So that was really helpful. What you're kind of, what you hope for if you get a kind of commission is someone who knows what they want but also has kind of there is wriggle room for you to be able to be creative because it's always quite difficult when someone comes along and chooses past work that you've done and then wants it to be exactly the same it's really difficult to make that happen because every piece is a different piece and commissions are difficult because usually actually I uh, when a client comes to me and wants a commission based piece they usually cite pieces I've just done for me, so um, which I find quite interesting. And so it will be a sketchbook page, and then it will be like, well, that's hard because I can't. It's really difficult to like take a sketchbook image, which has been quite loose and like organic, and turn it into something with a concept and, I, uh, and an idea behind it that doesn't belong to me; it's someone else's. So it, the best thing is to do for me I find to kind of make my life easier and feel a bit more comfortable in the process is just to be really clear from the beginning in those first few emails of like what they can expect from you, how long it's going to take, how much it's going to be because a lot of the time the worst thing about like this kind of work is there's not as much time and sort of respect given to you as an artist like it would be in a more kind of manual job it's important to put out ground rules and say like, okay, this is how much it's gonna cost. And um, I actually remember when we went to New York in our third year trip, we met loads of different illustration agents. And I remember one guy said, uh, don't undersell yourself because they're, what they're buying isn't the drawing, it's your head and your hand. And you've worked really hard and they're intelligent because you've, you've been working on these drawings. So they see it as one image, but it isn't one image. You actually make tons of images before the final and it's all work. And um, so I think, yeah, I guess, yeah, and, and if I was giving advice to, uh, to other illustrators, it would just be to kind of be really sure about how much work you're doing for someone. I moved from Falmouth town, which is a tiny place, it's like a shoebox, you always see the same people, um, for, to home in Somerset for a little bit and then I moved to London. At that time when I moved, I was, uh, 
someone got in touch with me, which was a really amazing opportunity from a gallery in Madrid um, called Do Design. And they really liked my work and it was just the kind of just, and it was, you know, so just early on starting out and she really liked what I was doing. And so then she basically invited me to come and do a solo show in Madrid, um, which was amazing and totally unexpected. And the show uh, was called I See You Not See Me and it was essentially drawings of people in London. So I used it almost as a reportage uh, concept of just, because I was walking around and I did a lot of walking when I first moved to London because I kept getting the buses wrong <laughs> and I, I was too scared to ride a bike at that point. So I walked everywhere and was just overwhelmed by strangers, just so many strangers. You never saw the same person twice and I found that fascinating and overwhelming and a bit existential at some points. But I, um, I wanted to record it and that's where, and I started in my sketchbooks and then it kind of turned into these final pieces and it eventually into an overall show. And, um, and it, it almost was a moment where I, I used my work to get to know a place and I found it comforting to do that and, um, and capture moments in time. And there's like a little drawing called, like from that show called Dalston Junction and it is just like the check the tube station I used to go past every day and um, and now I look back at those drawings and just think that's like a little time capsule. And I was kind of doing as much illustration as possible but I was also working as a nanny and uh, in a cafe becoming miserable um, and and then I just started thinking I don't really know where it came from but I was like I need to be able to make stuff for money and uh, to survive here and what can I do like what else do I know because illustration is random you, unless you're kind of you're on an agency and you're con constantly getting work and I started looking towards my kind of embroidery and hand sewing uh, abilities because I was sort of talk I was just doing a lot of talking asking constantly what everyone else is doing and and I met someone who was uh, who made like ballet shoes for the Royal Opera House and I thought that's cool I wouldn't mind work I wouldn't mind making ballet shoes I could do that as a part-time job or something and in that time I started kind of just getting back into it slightly like doing lots of embroidery and mending um, I got this one jumper in my in the rubbish little flat I was living in got completely attacked by moths and so I was just mending this jumper in the evenings and um, and, and certain friends noticed, started noticing all this mending and, and we were like, oh, I've got this, my favourite shirt and I really want it to be repaired and can you do it? And I did it and it was like, you know, for just like a tenner or whatever and it slowly started going up the pile, but also like how long it took and everything was done by hand. Eventually I started talking to Toast, which is a kind of lifestyle brand and they make really great clothes that are kind of built to last for life and... Um, I am their repairer, I, I became their repairer, but it wasn't a like, um, what I intended was just to kind of, if there was a broken lot of clothes, like perhaps I could mend them beautifully and we could do something with it. But in the end, it turned into me teaching workshops. It's basically repair techniques based around traditional hand stitch methods from India and Japan, which didn't quite reach us in the Western world. and. It's really easy and it just requires a bit of knowledge, some patches, some needles and threads and you can mend your own clothes, which is great and it can give you a real sense of confidence in your own abilities and also hopefully uh, reconnect you to the clothes that you own. I was doing these workshops and that kind of is what ended up leading me into writing a book about repair. It came mainly from just the response I was getting, you know, people who'd come and sit down and learn these really simple techniques would just go away feeling uh, just relaxed, like they could just slow down and reconnect with themselves and their hands and it had been so long for them since they'd done that. And also it just, it's, it's only good repair basically, if you can repair something then it's like that's just a purely positive thing as far as I'm concerned. The more I talked to people, the more I realised how important it is, not only for the planet to look after the things we buy, but also to be able to do something yourself. And I wanted to start kind of writing down 
Well, I was always writing down the things that I did repair, so I kind of had this collection of stories already, which was about, you know, it would be like repaired uh, blue boiler suit and the smell of it. <laughs> it just like smells like porridge and children and da 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 da, that's so weird. But, and then also it would be like, this person moves quickly, this person, you, like you can read a garment like a book. And I, and I had, I, it was just honestly, just for me, I was like collecting these stories in my sketchbooks because I found it interesting. It was like how much a jumper can tell you about somebody. Um, so, Anyway, I was approached by these, the, the publishers, Short Books, and they uh, loved my stories and wanted me to write them down, and I was very happy to, and so that became The Art of Repair, which is my book. It basically is kind of half manifesto on why it's important to mend things today, not just textiles, but anything, but also it's got some little techniques as well, so it's kind of, you look, you, I sort of talk about how to darn or how to use the Shiko repair, which is a Japanese mending technique. I wanted it to be something that left the reader feeling inspired to mend something themselves.